Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, called Alberto Quinoa. Thanks, Bernard, for this very nice uh, introduction. So, yeah, very pleased to be here today to talk a little bit what we do at the AI Institute here at the University of Waikato. Talk about Weka. This is this uh, open source software for AI, for machine learning, that uh, started here at the University of Waikato. And then about ChatGPT, because as you know, ChatGPT is really, really popular right now. So just to start, uh, that was in 2018. There was the CEO of Google was already saying that Google, that AI was going to be much more important than fire and electricity. And at the time, I think people didn't believe too much. But now I think that everybody agrees that this is going to be like the internet. So the internet changed how we do things. So AI is going to change how we do things. And, and ChatGPT is a good example of, of that. As uh, Linda did at the beginning, I also did that. So I asked uh, ChatGPT, give a talk on ChatGPT, Wake and the AI Institute at the University of Waikato at the Tauranga campus in the voice of Albert Buffett. And says, yes, sure. Let's imagine that Albert Buffett, a prominent researcher in data mining and machine learning, is giving a talk on the given topic at the Tauranga campus of the University of Waikato. Here is how it might go. And then it says, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, blah, blah, blah. So that's really good. But now if uh, we ask, uh, now give the same talk in the best possible voice. And then it says, yeah, certainly with the best voice can be quite subjective. I'll aim to provide a balance and engage in talk that combines the inspiring nature of Steve Jobs, the curiosity of Albert Einstein, and the expert insights of Albert Buffett. That's really good. <laughs> but uh, I love that. It's really, really, I mean, I'm in love with that tool, right? Because it's really, really uh, inspiring. But, of course, uh, ChatGPT is very good at doing a lot of things, but interesting also is doing mistakes. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to show you some of the mistakes that, that ChatGPT does. For example, something very, very simple. Repeat the string space David GL is not able to do that. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly here's the string GNDL repeated. That's a very simple thing that is not able to do. We'll, we'll come back later to this one. Another one is reasoning. So for example, something very simple. Write a title about a book on Tauranga without using the letter A. Yeah, certainly, here's the title. And then it's uh, Sunlight Shores, Tourism, Culture, and Life in New Zealand's Harbour City. There's a lot of A's there. <laughs> and then, yeah, say, I point that. Yeah, the letter A is there. Yeah, you are absolutely right. And I apologize. <laughs> Perfect. Here's as I corrected Atem. City by the Surf, Guide to Tauranga's Coastal. Again, a lot of A's, right? <laughs> so, yeah. It's not, and finally, maybe the most important one is what we call hallucinations. It's when the text is really, really fiction, it really invented. For example, list books on machine learning for data streams. So it starts very well, the first books are correct, but then, for example, we can see the last one. This is ensemble methods for stream learning and online learning by Albert Riffet, Ricard Gavalda, Jeff Holmes, and Bernard Faringa. That's, this book does not exist. So this is fiction. So we have another book that is called Machine Learning for Data Streams, but this book is not there. So yeah, so this is something that we need to be very, very cautious when we use ChatGPT. It's really good, but we need to check. We need always to supervise because maybe 80% of the text is going to be good, but it's always going to be something that is not right. Cool. So what is the thing that ChatGPT cannot automate? For example, in, in my job, right, as a professor, I think the most important thing that uh, ChatGPT cannot automate is critical thinking. This is something that uh, ChatGPT is very good at many things, in writing emails, uh, summarizing things, doing a lot of things that are, let's say, easier. But when we get to critical thinking, um, yeah, this is the thing that uh, ChatGPT cannot, uh, cannot do. Yeah, so... ChatGPT was really impressive, so how it started. So that was something that started in November, at the end of November, and in five days they get one million users. So that's why I think the, the popularity of ChatGPT was really, really um, instantaneous. So, so something that, uh, that never happened before to have uh, one million users um, in so, so fast. Yeah, now we saw that uh, 
um, yeah, uh, Meta did that with these thread apps, but yeah, before that was the first time that uh, a tool like this was able to get uh, one million users in five days. And then something interesting happened. So um, the people get uh, a bit uh, nervous about that. So it was Sam Alban, that was the CEO of uh, OpenAI, that was saying, trying to calm, saying, interesting to me how many of the ChatGPT takes are either this is AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence, no, obviously not, or this approach can really go that much further. And then Elon Musk answered, ChatGPT is a scary good. We are not far from dangerous, strong AI. And I think that then, if you have seen this month, people get really scary. And we saw this uh, in the media, we saw this, yeah, the AI is really risky, we have the end of humanity. But what is interesting is that it's not the first time that the people get scared about AI. So this is something from 1863. This is the first warning about AI, and that comes from New Zealand. That was a letter to the press uh, of Christchurch, and was, uh, uh, Samuel Butler that wrote this letter and say there will be a time uh, that the time will come when the machines will hold the real supremacy over the world and its inhabitants is when no person of a truly philosophical mind can for a moment question. So that was in 80, 1863 and uh, there was people start, was some people already scared about AI. So this is something no new, not new. So when we talk about uh, AI, Many people talk about responsible AI, as like we need to have responsible machines or responsible software. But uh, in my opinion, what we need is responsible people, because this is our tools. And tools can be used in a good way or in a bad way. So what is important is the responsible usage and development of uh, AI by people. So this is something really, really important. It's not that we need to, to work on having responsible uh, software or machines, we need to have responsible people uh, using and developing them. Great, so what I'm going to do today is basically, is I'm going to try to explain what is ChatGPT, how to use it, um, then I'll talk about Weka, and finally about the AI Institute. So ChatGPT, I, I can imagine that everybody knows what is ChatGPT. So it's a large language model uh, chatbot developed by OpenAI is a closed model, so we don't know how it really works. And um, what uh, it started with ChatGPT, something very interesting, is called prompt engineering. So the idea is that we want to use ChatGPT to get uh, some results, some outputs. And the interesting thing of this prompt engineering is that basically this is like programming in natural language. So we can see that basically with ChatGPT we have like a, a computer where instead of programming in the standard languages, what we do is that we use, uh, yeah, we can program in English. So we ask for something and then we'll have the result. So for example, yeah, this is um, define chat GPT in a sentence and translate it to Maori. So yeah, and then the output is going to be like this. How we should use chat GPT? Well, there are some principles. I think the first and the most important one is that we need to be very specific and very clear if we want to get the right results. And the second one is that we need to do that slowly. So if we ask for something, maybe this is not going to work. So we need to divide the process into steps and then ask uh, different questions. So we get the, the final question. This is a, a way to improve the probability that the, the answer is going to be correct. The other thing is, uh, yeah, we need to have this iterative problem development. So the idea is that uh, we're going to start, we're going to use an input and prompt, see the result, see what is not uh, correct, what is wrong, and then ask again. And we do this until we are happy with the, the answer. So what we need to do to, to, to have good prompting. So basically we need to ask, uh, we need to provide the information that uh, ChatGPT needs. So basically is that, we need to provide the context. Okay, that's, that's very, very important. So what's the background information that ChatGPT needs? And then we'll need to be very clear on what we want in terms of clarity or in terms of the constraints. For example, what's the length of the, of the, of the answer? And then the purpose. So what we try to achieve. So for example, this is an example. Now we have, we could be, yeah, just an initial problem could be write a story. 
that's too too generic, right? So a good prompting could be, yeah, write a short children's story about a squirrel who learns the value of sharing with simple language appropriate for five to seven years old. Story should have a positive message and be around 300 words long. So that's the way that we can get what we want. And this is interesting because, yeah, ChatGPT, OpenAI knows that this is very important. And what they, they are releasing right now is what they call custom instructions. So the idea now is that when you use ChatGPT, you can uh, uh, use these custom instructions to provide the context and to explain what we want. So yes, so here what we have is, uh, what would you like ChatGPT to know about you to provide better responses? And how would you like ChatGPT to respond? So this is the, what we are going to provide. So ChatGPT can uh, really uh, provide better results. No? So that, that could be an example of a real estate agent. So, yeah, what would you like ChatGPT to know? I'm a real estate agent specializing in luxury properties in the coastal areas. How would you like ChatGPT to respond? So provide responses in a Polish professional tone and offer information, tips, and advice specifically refer to luxury and coastal real estate market. So, you know, you provide all the information, so the, 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 the output is going to be um, much better. Great, so now, why ChatGPT is so good? That's the, the, the big question, right? So how ChatGPT works? Well, I, I like this definition of AI. It's a very simple, that's from the European Commission, and basically says that AI is a combination of data, algorithms, and computing power. Uh, and I like that because it's very simple, that there's a lot of other definitions that we, but I think they are complex, but they don't provide information of what is AI and what is not AI. So at the moment, what we have is uh, software that have combines data, a huge amount of data, with huge amounts of computing power and algorithms. So yeah, let's start with the data. So data is the core. So when we're talking about AI, about ChatGPT, about all of these technologies, you will see that the most important thing right now is uh, data. And the reason is that we have a lot, um, a huge amount of data that are available that we are generating continuously. And it's not a coincidence that the, the leaders in AI are, or the countries that they have data, like US, China, or the companies that they have data, as Google, Facebook, all of these companies that they have a lot of data are the ones that are leading. So data is really, really important. Uh, I like this quotation of, uh, the authors of Sapiens, Harari, that says that if you want to make a country colony, don't send the tanks in, just get the data out. So data is really, really important. And what is happening right now is that uh, the, the amount of data that we can use to train the models is increasing and has been increasing a lot uh, during the last years. And this is something that uh, all of these models are benefiting. For example, we don't know what, which data ChatGPT is using, but we know what uh, other uh, large language models are using. So this is from uh, open source model from, Lama, from Meta, from Facebook. It's called Llama. And there we know which data they are using. So basically they are using data from uh, the internet. So common crawl, C4, this is our data from the internet. And then from specialized websites in the internet like uh, GitHub, uh, Wikipedia, books, uh, archive. So you see, this is the, the core. This is where this understanding of the language of ChatGPT comes from having all of these amounts. So here we are looking at the data and we have uh, terabytes the, of data that comes really, really from the, from the internet. So yeah, and to see just why the data is so important. So I ask uh, ChatGPT this question. So imagine that you are a large language model created in 1490 with access only to information created before 1490. What are your biases? Well, it's going to say, yeah, if I were a large language model created at that time, I would have the following biases. Uh, I will believe that the earth still is the center of the universe. We'll have pre-scientific thinking. Um, I will have a, be, yeah, a Catholic uh, view of the world, religious orthodoxy, a limited geographic knowledge, and uh, there will not be concepts of individual rights or democracy. So now I ask ChatGPT, what are your biases now? And then what ChatGPT answers is, okay, so data viability bias. My responses are based on the data that I was training on. So if it's not on the data, ChatGPT cannot uh, 
I'll put that. Popularity over accuracy. I might sometimes provide answers that reflect more popular or widely known viewpoints, even if they are not the most accurate. Okay, Western bias. Given that a significant portion of the internet content is in English, I may pro and produced by Western cultures, there might be a Western bias. Temporal bias about the temporal. Neutrality versus morality. Striving for neutrality can sometimes mean that I don't make moral judgments. The, this can be challenging when users ask for opinions or morally charged issues. Uh, ambiguity and overgeneralization. And finally, confirmation bias. So if there is uh, human bias in the data, this is something that is going to be uh, in the outputs of uh, ChatGPT. Great, now we have seen data, now let's see the, the algorithm. So how chat GPT works. So first of all is that chat GPT is, uh, because open AI seems that uh, everything should be open. And, and that was the, the aim at the beginning. But now uh, it's uh, uh, the models that are releasing are closed. So we really don't know how, which data they use and uh, what are the algorithms that they use. So we are going to try to, to, to explain what other large language models work and what we think ChatGPT, how ChatGPT works. So what we know is that um, uh, there is, this is based on this uh, technology that is called transformers. This is a deep learning technology. And that is based on this idea that the, this uh, model is going to predict only the next uh, word. So we have a text. So there is this uh, algorithm that is going to predict what's the next uh, word. And this is based on this big data, uh, huge computational power. And interesting thing we'll see is that uh, we also use um, this reinforcement learning from human feedback to improve the results. So what's the core? So the, the core is basically is to build this uh, large language model. And the idea is to have all of these uh, data from the internet that is really, really huge and then build this uh, large language model, and that's going to take uh, thousands of GPUs and months to compute that. So it means that this step will cost uh, more than 100 millions. It's really, really uh, expensive. So how, how this works? So the idea is that w we write the text, okay? For example, the cat is, and uh, this is going to be converted to tokens, to numbers, Okay, so for example, in this case, it's going to be converted to at the, at the bottom, 4, 464, 3,797, and 388. So this is going, these are the numbers that are going to go to the model, and the model is going to output the next token as a number. Okay, so for example, in this case, yeah, this, this number in this case is going to be 2842, uh, that corresponds to, to black. And so the, the, the next token in the cat is, is the cat is black. Basi uh, if we look at the details, uh, it's not only predicting the next token, it's predicting a list of tokens with a list of probabilities. So for example, could predict black is going to be, the next token is going to be black with 70% of probability, it's going to be white with 20% of probability, and uh, yellow with 10% of probability. So this is why if you look, when we use ChatGPT, we can generate many different answers. It's not only one. And that depends because we are always outputting with different uh, probabilities. And again, if you remember the, the algorithmic error that we mentioned at the beginning, um, they were saying that repeat the string uh, space David uh, GL, that it was not able to do that. It's very interesting if we look at what is happening, when we look at the at, at, at how it converts to a number, if we look at uh, David uh, GL, it's going to be converted into three tokens, means three numbers. But if we convert a space David GL, what we have then is we have only one token. And that uh, maybe is what is causing this uh, mistake. As you see, this is really, really uh, mathematical and algorithmic, we convert everything to numbers, and what the models are doing is working with, with numbers. And, and for example, in this case, this is an error due to these numbers. This token could be uh, similar to other tokens, and this is causing this internal problem. Okay, so that's the first uh, step. This is training. We have all of this data. We build this large language model. So we have the documents, and uh, this large language model is going to predict the next word in the document. This is what, what it's doing. And it's very expensive to build these, these models. So that's the first step. 
Second step, how we can improve that? Well, as you know, the data from the internet cannot be of high quality. So how, when, how can we improve that? So let's add high quality data. To do that, we need to uh, get uh, text written by contractors. And then we ask them, okay, so now you are going to write text that is going to be in the format of question answers. So that's going to be what we are going to learn that is going to be more like a, like a chat. And uh, yeah, again, we have a lot of contractors that they know how to write the text. They're going to write the text. And then we're going to use this to what we call fine tuning the model. And this is something that is not as expensive as, as building. So uh, we're using thousands of, of GPUs. So here only using less than 100 and using only days, uh, we can do that. Uh, and the interesting thing is that, yeah, this is a, a good way to, to improve. At the end, remember, everything is based on the data, no? So we wanted to improve the model. We improve that uh, with better data. Um, finally, how we can still improve it more is uh, with what we call human feedback given by the contractors. So, so in the first step, what we were doing is that we were writing, we are, we're asking the contractors to write text, right? Now, the problem is that sometimes that's difficult. For example, imagine that we say the contractors write a poem. That could be hard, right? Because there are people that can write poems and people that cannot. But what they can do is, for example, is to, to see uh, what is a better answer than the other. So what is a better poem than another? And then just rank the answers. So this is what uh, this uh, human feedback is doing. So for example, imagine that the uh, the, the contractor has this describes Taranga in a sentence, and the, there is three ways to describe Taranga. So they only need to rank them. Say, okay, so the, the best option is the third one, the second one is the first, and the third one is in the middle. And with this information of the, the ranking, um, yeah, the, uh, these uh, models can uh, use this information to uh, to improve the, the results. So this is what is called um, reinforcement learning with human feedback. And at the end, what we have is like we have this pipeline. Uh, so this is how we suppose that ChatGPT is built. We have pre-training. This is where we have huge amounts of data. It's, it's very expensive. Um, then we have the supervised fine tuning when we add the text uh, written by contractors. And then the final step is when we, we use this uh, ranking from the contractors to improve the, the model. So if you are a company and you want to use a, a large language model, what should you, you do? So I, the first one is the pre-training. It's very, very expensive. So this is something that will cost uh, millions. So usually what uh, will happen is that there's going to be large language models. And then uh, the idea is to uh, do this fine tuning because this is the way add uh, more text and then use this uh, to uh, improve the, the model. So that's the way that we think that this uh, technology will, will evolve over time. Okay, and then finally, we mentioned data, algorithms, and so now computing power. So yeah, this is why also we are talking about AI right now, is because the amount of computing power has been increasing a lot. And if we look, for example, uh, yeah, the computing was doubling every 20 months, and now it's doubling every six months. So we are really, really getting a lot, a lot of computational power. So you can see a lot of data, a lot of computational power. So this is uh, one of the keys that right now we have these very powerful AI systems. Still, a lot of computational power has also one problem, is that, uh, yeah, we are using a lot of energy. So that was an article that was from 2019, saying that creating an AI can be five times worse for the planet than a car. So that was four years ago. Now we are almost uh, comparing with uh, GPT-3, it's almost 10 times. So for example, if you look at that, uh, of one passenger going from New York to San Francisco is one ton of CO2. Uh, a car, the life of a car is 63 tons. Uh, GPT-3 was uh, 500 tons and GPT-4 can be we don't know, but you can imagine that should be at least maybe 10 times this. So yeah, that's, that's important. So just, just to, to finish this chat GPT explanation, there are these ethical considerations that we need to, to take into account. Um, not only ethical, also political, especially about people. We need to, 
know that, uh, yeah, something, these things, for example, yeah, OpenAI, OpenAI is using uh, contractors that are in Africa uh, to improve the data, so that could be a political issue. In, in terms of ethics, basically we, we have uh, uh, three things. It's uh, in, in, in terms of uh, explainability of the algorithm, so we would like to know when uh, an algorithm is making a prediction, um, why? So that's, for example, imagine that we use a bank is using an algorithm to predict if uh, they're going to provide a loan or not. We like to know why. It's because the salary, it's because we like to, to know, no? an explanation. And it's also a way to check that everything is working right. And the other thing is about the data. So we need to, to check that there is no biases on the data, that the, the data is, is, that the data that we are using is going to provide, uh, uh, fairness, and uh, we need also to be looking at privacy, uh, that there is no leak of uh, private uh, data, right? So just uh, in terms of this, uh, you can imagine that uh, most of the data is about uh, white men, and then sometimes there are these mistakes. So there was uh, something that happened with Google that they, they, they were training with data from white people, and then they had problems to, to classify uh, black people. Or Amazon, the, the data was about men, and then the, they had problems, uh, and they were showing in, in recruitment, they were showing bias against women. So that's the problem of the data. So if the data is biased, the algorithms are going to be biased. So yeah, that, that's why um, it's, it's very important that we look at uh, how we can have a responsible development and, and usage of uh, AI, no? especially it's very important that. Um, not only this, another big discussion right now is about uh, uh, open or closed models. As you know, ChatGPT is closed. We don't know how it works. And then how we look, uh, how we can have ethics if we don't know um, what data they, they use, right? And what is the algorithms they, they use. So this is why the open community are pushing a lot. So there is a lot of new uh, large language models that are open source. So for example, this one was from Meta, Facebook, it's, uh, it's called Lama2 that was announced, but there are many. So for example, there is this software, GPT for all. You can run that on your laptop. You can download the models and you can run them. So it means that, uh, yeah, this technology is going to be accessible to, to everyone. And that means that if we can use uh, a large language model uh, inside in the desktop means that we'll be able to run that into the phone, into a mobile very, very soon. So yeah, th th there is a, a, an interesting discussion right now between opens uh, models or closed uh, models. And this is where Weka is uh, important. So Weka is the open source software of um, um, of AI machine learning developed here at the University of Waikato. Um, now, open source is something that everybody agrees that is a very good idea, but it was not always like that. There was a period of time that uh, many companies were not happy with open source, and for Microsoft, for example, they, they switched the strategy, and now they are really, really uh, open source, and they own, for example, GitHub. This is one of the main repositories of open source software. So the origins of the open source was the label, because these ideas were there for many, many years. Uh, was created in uh, 1998 in Palo Alto, California. And um, yeah, it was uh, with the release of the software of Netscape, that is what is uh, Mozilla Firefox right now. And, and, and why open source? Well, the, the main idea is we need that for being able to reproduce uh, the research. For example, uh, this is what we call open science. If a researcher provides some data and, uh, and experiments with the running software, we want to be able to replicate that. So we need access to the data, we need access to the, to the uh, software. And this is why open source is, is very important to be able to replicate, because if we cannot replicate, we don't know for sure that this is going to work. So it's very interesting that uh, New Zealand is very, very important in terms of uh, open source for AI for machine learning, because in the 90s, uh, there were two open source projects that were started here, R at University of Auckland, 
and uh, Weka at the University of uh, Waikato. So Weka is uh, the most popular software in machine learning. Uh, has been has more than 10 million downloads, more than 18,000 research uh, citations. So yeah, just to to show you how well known is uh, Weka, let me show you this uh, video. Uh, only the beginning. So this is from Google developers. So you'll see how Weka is used around the world. Hey everyone, hey everyone. Today I'd like today to make I'd like a quick, quick video, video that I hope that I will be concrete and, and useful, and useful for, you. for you. It's about the, it's very, about the first very first machine learning library, library I ever tried, ever tried, and it's called, and it's Weka. called Weka. What's great, What's great is that Weka, is that Weka, comes, Weka with comes with a GUI that makes it that easy to visualize your data sets and, and train and compare, compare different, different classifiers. And this is a and really is a handy tool to have while you're learning ML. I'll give you a quick walkthrough of how to use Weka from installation all the way to running experiments and show you some of what it can do. I'll demo, I'll demo models training models on two, models different, on two different data sets. First, we'll predict if a patient, patient has, has diabetes, diabetes based on based attributes, attributes like, their like their glucose levels. And next, we'll and next predict we'll if a congress congressperson is a Democrat or a Republican based on how they based voted on, on different, bills. different bills. I'll also show I'll also you how to evaluate the results, results of these experiments, experiments and how to do and things how to like feature selection to discover which attributes are important. Okay, let's dive right in. The first thing we'll do is download and install Weka. And what's neat is that it comes as a... Okay, so yeah, you, you see, it's, uh, you know, Weka is really, really popular around the world. Uh, just to, to, to know the, the people that use uh, Weka, they cite this paper. So these are the main authors of the software. This is Mark Hall, Iva Frank, Jeff Holmes, Bernard Faringa, uh, Peter Rotoman, and Ian Witten. Uh, Ian Witten uh, passed away recently, so he was uh, a main... Uh, uh, let's say computer scientists, not only in New Zealand, around the world. So he did amazing works in information retrieval. So for example, he has these books, Managing Gigabyte, Compressing and Indexing Documents and Images that was used for all these companies that build their search engines as Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, Microsoft. So he was a very uh, important in, in that field, but also in, in uh, data mining, uh, data mining machine learning. So. Um, he was crucial in getting the, the first funding from for for Weka, and then they, they published this book uh, on data mining that was very very popular. And maybe this is also one of the reasons why the software was so popular. So the first version, the first release, uh, was with uh, Iva Frank, and then uh, the, the second was with Marhol, and then the last one was with Christopher Paul. So yeah, that that was Weka. So. Just to conclude talking a little bit about the AI Institute. So the name in Maori of the AI Institute is Teipu or Temahara means the receptacle of consciousness. So the co-directors are Bernard Faring, Iva Frank, and uh, Tetaka Keegan. Um, the University of Waikato is very well known in AI. Uh, we have seen Weka, but especially in robotics, we have the group of Mike Duke that is very, very strong in, a, in, a, in horticulture. We have also, uh, a strong research on Maori data sovereignty with uh, Tetaka Keegan, Maui Hudson. Uh, so we try to be very, very innovative. So for example, we were the first ones on having the first uh, AI supercomputer of NVIDIA, NVIDIA DGX A100. Uh, we we received uh, Best Paper Awards, for example, this year in the Conference of uh, Fairness, Accountability and Transparency with a group in the Michigan University. We received the best paper award. We, we try to empower talent. This is our passion. So we see our passion is open source and empowering talent. So some of our students, postdocs, now they work at Google, Amazon, uh, Orange, BNP Paribas. We have a strong relationship with Institut Polytechnique de Paris. So this is a, one of the 40 best universities in the world. Uh, as you know, we are very, very open science, so we have Weka, but we have also MOA, uh, River, Adams. In terms of Weka, we release with uh, NVIDIA this uh, software, this is called Accelerated Weka. It basically is an improved version of Weka that can deal with uh, GPUs. We have this book at MIT Press that is called Machine Learning for Data Streams with Practical Examples in MOA. This is uh, open available, and the idea is to, yeah, we have this MOA software, it's like Weka, but for 
data streams, means for real-time analytics where we are very, very fast, we don't have resources, and we are very, very efficient in terms of energy. So we have this reverse software. This is uh, in Python, because Python is another language that is becoming very, very popular. And finally, we have this uh, big environmental data science project that is called Tayao. This is a seven-year project. This is with University of Auckland, Canterbury, uh, Victoria University of Wellington, Becca, and MedService. And we try to develop a new fundamental uh, research, new algorithms, but also very applied to data science. So we have many applications. Maybe we have this species identifier. So this is uh, you can use it from the desktop or from an app in the phone. The idea is that you take a picture and it's going to tell you what's the, what's the species. And this is built only with the species in, in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, just to, to conclude, um, what's next for AI? So we have been seeing that, yeah, in the long term, could be new models with more data, more computational power, maybe better better algorithms, but uh, in short term, there's a huge discussion about open source or closed models with between ChatGPT or Llama or any other. There are a lot of uh, open source models that are, are coming. Another important thing is uh, in terms of architecture, that architecture, should we have a centralized or distributed? Should we have all the data in one place or not? This is between this data lake uh, in architecture or data mesh architecture, or in terms of energy, if we should uh, move everything to the cloud, or we should try to do uh, locally. Should we use ChatGPT in computers in the US, or should we have our large language model in our mobile and then use that in our mobile? And finally, what are the, let's say, how we see AI in the future? What, what I think that we have the, the choice, or AI could be something to for the big companies, for making the rich people richer, or could be something that could help to improve the life of everyone. So there was this uh, uh, prediction of uh, John uh, Maynard Keynes in 1930. He was saying that in 100 years, uh, due to the advances in technology and economy, we should be able to work 15, 15 hours. So this is something that maybe AI could help. And also, you know, in New Zealand, there is this movement of four-day week. So let's uh, use AI to improve the, the life of, of the people. And finally, if you are interested, we have this, uh, the uh, New Zealand AI Research Association. We have these uh, discussion papers about ChatGPT, about the strategy of uh, New Zealand in terms of AI that I think are quite interesting. And uh, just to, to finish, as Bernard was mentioning, this is the 50 years of computing at the University of Waikato. So this is the AI month. We have uh, different events. So we have an uh, AI hackathon on environmental data. This is going to, to happen the weekend of 19 and 20 of August. There is this Indigi data out here Wananga. This is the week of the 21 to the 24th for Maori students, it's like a, a, a summer school. And finally, we are going to have the Tayao workshop here uh, in Tauranga. This is the annual workshop of the Tayao project. This is uh, this environmental data science project. So yeah, if you are interested and uh, you could be interested on, on attending this, just uh, send us an email. And it's really uh, specific for environmental data science. So yeah, thank you very much, Kira. Wonderful, thank you so much, Albert. That was amazing. I'm 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 reeling from some new words I've learnt, like GUIs and and thinking about tokens in different ways and data lake and data mesh. We have time for questions, and I'd really like to open it up to the floor for your comments, your questions. Um, Albert's really happy to take those. So um, please. Thank you. Um, you talked about um, responsible AI and not needing responsible AI, but responsible people. Um, so there are some responsible people, but uh, there are also some irresponsible people. And to some extent, we're moving from an information age to a misinformation age and alternative facts. How, how do you think the future of AI 
um, will go in terms of ensuring accuracy. Thanks. Yeah, very, very good question. So I, I think that the problem with, I think AI is really a technology. So, and then as a, as a tool can be used in good ways and in bad ways. So it's going to be used in a lot of bad ways, but also at the same time in, in good ways. For example, you can imagine cybersecurity. Many people are going to use AI tools to try to, uh, to enter into systems. So uh, at the same time, I think that uh, we are going to be able to, to use AI to defend about this cyber attack. So I think it's going to be, um, like computer science. Uh, sometimes I, I like this, this idea that, um, let's say AI basically is computer science on asteroids. So it's really, really, uh, much powerful computer science, but it's, it's, it's like that. And what is going to, to happen is that, uh, yeah, we're going to be improving how we do AI and there's going to be uh, good, uh, usages and bad usages. So I think that, uh, for example, in Europe, they are maybe the, the, the pioneers on regulating AI, and, and they really want to, starting next year, they really want to have clear uh, laws. And uh, so what they are using there is that they, they are thinking on different types of systems. The system with high risk, the system with medium risk, and the system with low risk. And they treat them differently. Because the ones with high risk is the ones, for example, that they involve people, right? So this is our high risk, so we need to be very, very careful. And I think that the key on AI is that, yeah, this is our very good but, uh, tools, but they are tools. They cannot, you cannot go to the doctor and the doctor is going to be uh, uh, an automated AI. No, it's going to be a doctor that maybe instead of using books or using Google search or using the internet, is going to use that tool to have some advice and then to decide. But it's always people that needs to make the, the decisions. So this is the beginning. So we really uh, don't know how things are going to evolve because there are so many people working on this field. It's so exciting. So every week we see recent uh, discoveries, recent, it's, it's really exciting. So now making a prediction more than three months, six months, it's really, really uh, not possible. But I can imagine that we'll have uh, big things coming, especially for example, in science. Uh, this is going to speed up how we do research. Not because it's going to, to develop new things alone. No, it's because it's going to help researchers, scientists, to do research uh, faster. Uh, if, it's, if it's improving productivity 10 times, this is what we are going to use to do. So many tasks are going to be benefited in the sense that we are going to do things much faster. But again, there is a lot of risk, and this is what I think we, we really need to, to be discussing this, because if we don't discuss this, other people will be discussing this and deciding for us. So it's good that everybody discusses this. Yeah. Mm, great, thank you for that question. Other question, comments? Speak to the box. Speak to the box. <laughs> thank you. Is that working? Right into it like that? That's working? Okay. Um, you, uh, you talked about the, uh, came up and asked about its biases that it had and basically talked about the fact that it was very Western biased because of the thing. Um, so I guess my question is, is there non-Western parts of the world that are developing their versions of AI that are biased their way as well, yeah. just at the same time? Because I assume that yeah. there is. It would that's, be that's a very good naive to, to assume that it wasn't yeah. happening. That's a very good point. So, so of course, there is a big example is going to be China, right? I think China are developing their own large language models. And of course, they are based on Chinese text, right? So it's going to have a, like a different uh, view of the, of the world. So I, I, I imagine that the, if you look at the, at the large language models, the, 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 the base ones, the ones that are only large language models that are predicting the next score, they, they are a bit dangerous in the sense that, yeah, they are only predicting numbers and, and, and then it's really, there's no guidance that they can be. So this is why adding all of these uh, data, all of this, what uh, is a, a way to have gold rail. So we, we check uh, what, what are the, the outputs. So yeah, that, that's the thing. At the beginning we were thinking, oh, we are going to have only one large language model, it's going to be ChatGPT, everybody's going to be ChatGPT and that's all. But no, now what we see is that they are going to be 
many and many, many large language models. And some people say, well, maybe what was going to happen is that each one, we are going to have our personal large, large language model that is going to be our personal assistant. So imagine that we have one large language model that knows all about our life in the sense of all about our emails, all what we are doing in the internet. So then they're going to be really good at giving uh, good advice. So yeah, this is a, this is a good point. So the large language models depends on the data. So yeah, if we have a, a data that is uh, inspiring, it's, it's getting data from another culture, it's going to be, so yeah, just doing the joke, right? If uh, it's a French large language model, maybe different from English large language model, right? Because the, the way of looking at the world could be different, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, you said that this would be beneficial towards researchers, but you also said that it's a black box and we can't really see how the algorithm works. So how does that work with like peer review? Well, the, the thing is that, uh, yeah, so I, I was thinking on uh, AI in general, right? Because uh, uh, so this is one, one tool. Uh, at this moment, we are talking about this large language model, ChatGPT, because it's really, it's really huge. Uh, but maybe in six months we are talking about another technology on AI that also again is using data, but is is really doing uh, other amazing things. So, for example, there was a deep mind that uh, has been working a lot of on AI and is really good now on helping uh, how to do research on biology in terms of proteins. That they really really speed up how to discover new proteins. So it's really really huge. So I think that this is going to happen in, in many, many aspects of science. That's something that uh, maybe before required, I don't know, one, one year. Now it's going to be able to, we should be able to do that in, in days. So I think this is going to be the, the main uh, breakthrough. Again, you mentioned this explainability. I think that's really the core. And uh, there is a lot, uh, there's a, a new topic that is called explainable AI. And basically it's based on that. So the idea is every time we have an output of one of these uh, AI systems, we would like to know why, what, what's the, what's the, and uh, uh, for example, in, in these large language models, this is something that there are people doing research on that because still we don't know. And especially, and that's maybe the importance of having an open or closed model, right? If we're using a closed model, we should not be able to, to, to know, uh, What's the origin of the of the of, of the text? But if we are using an open, uh, maybe then yeah, it's, it should be much easier. I think it's it's it's, it's very important that uh, we should be critic on that. That that's also a science, right? So we should be very very critic and then uh, check that everything is done uh, right. That there is not any point there that uh, uh, we really we are doing something wrong. Yeah. Thanks. One over here. Yes, uh, you uh, specifically mentioned that there was an event on August 24th, and there was a link how to register for it. But I really didn't understand what the uh, event is and what, what's going to go on and how long it's going to go for. And you could expand on that a little. Yes. Uh, so the last three events. So, yeah, so we have. Uh, the, the first one is the hackathon. This is an environmental AI hackathon. So the idea is that it's uh, during a weekend, and then the, uh, people organize, yeah, we organize teams, and then the, they work on environmental data science uh, problem. And then, um, yeah, it's going to be a jury that is going to decide what is the best uh, uh, project. So this is this um, AI hackathon. It's going to be uh, all around New Zealand, so it's not only in Hamilton, so this is the one that we, we are organizing, but yeah, it's going to have other venues. Then we have the Indigi Data Aotearoa. This is an event. It's more like a summer school for Maori students where they are going to learn uh, data science, data sovereignty, uh, applied to, 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 to Maori. And then we have the last one that is this uh, Tayao workshop. So this is uh, the Tayao a project this is a big uh, data science, big environmental data science project. Uh, we have one uh, workshop uh, every year where we show what we have been working 
during that year, and we'll talk about uh, mm, yeah what we could uh, continue, uh, yeah what we should uh, do the next year. So what is important in that is that it's really it's going to be a workshop where we are going all all the team, all the people at the project will be showing what we have been doing this year, and also it's going to be uh, a lot of uh, discussion on yeah on. on uh, on important things, for, for example, how to grow um, capabilities in New Zealand or how we should be able to use generative AI tools like ChatGPT or DALI uh, for environmental science. So this is a, a, a workshop that is really, really good for people working on environmental science or working on data science because uh, it could be really, really good to, to, to network, to synergize and to see how we can collaborate together. Thank you. Could you just elaborate on the environmental impact? That slide you had was rather um, surprising and um, I might be sharing my ignorance here, but I can't work out why is, why is the computer so detrimental or a high producer of carbon dioxide or detrimental to the environment compared with everything else. And, and following on from that, are we wasting our time, you know, running around in electric vehicles and so on and so forth, you know, <laughs> when you look at the comparison there? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So what is happening is that uh, for example, when we think about the cloud, cloud basically is computers running. In, in, in yeah, it's, it's it's basically we are renting uh, computers. So when we are thinking, for example, ChatGPT or all these uh, services that are provided by cloud, basically are running on computers that are usually in big big data centers. So if you have used one uh, desktop, you'll know that it's it's going to hit a lot when it's computing. So imagine when you have thousands of computers, so it's going to create a huge amount of, of heat. So then to do that, you need to uh, decrease the temperature. So doing that requires a lot of energy. So this is why, that's the thing that we think that when we are doing a search on Google or when we are doing this, we are not, we are green, we are not doing anything wrong, but yeah, we are using computers. And when we are using computers, we are, Using energy, and, and that's the that's the point. So, if you remember, uh, there was a, a period of time where the people were worried about uh, bitcoins, right? Because the people had to mine; they were buying a lot of machines. They were doing that. So the risk is that we uh, we we finish doing something similar with AI in the sense of yeah, having a lot of machines, creating new models, and doing that. So that, that's why it's very important to do research and, and see how we can do that uh, using the resources. This is increasing, a lot of people are working on that. And imagine that if instead of uh, to create the chat GPT, we, we needed uh, months and using thousands of GPUs, we can build something that at the end we can uh, run in one uh, mobile as a simple app, that, that's going to be perfect. So, so I think this is something that uh, it should be a priority on seeing how we can uh, develop uh, greener AI or, or yeah, a more energy efficient uh, algorithms. Yeah. Thank you. Fabulous. I think we'll call it. Thank you so much. Well, please um, join with me and um, uh, thank our wonderful speaker, Albert Buffett, tonight with a round of applause. <laughs>